Okay, so I'm not as sure if everyone has seen the remind text message that I sent out last night, but I did finally finish. Um, I don't know if it was eight or nine o'clock. It was somewhere around there. Um, when I finally finished all the grading and I posted all the scores everywhere and I um, posted your feedback, okay? And so I just wanted to quickly show you where to get the feedback. I tried to explain in the text message, but sometimes it's not um, as self-explanatory as I try to make it. So let me go to the student view so that you can see I on my screen what you see when you log in. So when you click on the math 1414 class, um, it's section 61 if you're in the face-to-face -face, and it's section 186 if you're in the online class. But what you wanna look for is the four digit number 1414, okay? And then if you haven't looked at the feedback yet and haven't looked at your grade book since I posted everything, you might have like a little blue circle with the number one. Um, so if you do, it's not a big deal. I don't because I already clicked on it, but you would click on grades so that you can see the grade book. And then again, this is just my little student view. So I don't really turn anything in. So you notice a lot of stuff says missing, right? But what I wanted you to see was right here where the unit A test is, um, you'll see these little comment icons right here, okay? That's what you need to click on. And when you click on it, you can see the files that I uploaded. Now for my example, um, I just uploaded the solutions, but for you, you should have two attachments um, showing there. One of them will be the solutions. And then the other one is actually your paperwork with all my feedback on it. Okay, so um, I just wanted to make you aware that when you do see the feedback, you're going to see these little tables all over everything. Um, let me change you over to my camera so you can see what I'm talking about. You're going to see a table that looks kind of like this. Okay, so you're going to see A, N, and E. That is for my scoring according to the rubric. So for A, you're either gonna get zero points or one point. And that's because either you selected the correct answer or you didn't. And so if you did not select the correct answer in Canvas, you get zero points here. If you did select the correct answer, then you got one point here. But that's all you get for clicking on the right answer. So a lot of students have already been messaging me, I had a hundred, how did I go from a hundred to such and such score, right? Because yes, Canvas grades that you clicked everything correctly, but for me and for your grade, that's only one point. That's only 10% of the whole test. So if you click all the right answers and you get 100 after you submit the test, that does not mean that that's your score and that you got 100 on that test. You have to wait until I grade it in order to know what your actual test score is because you could only get a 10. If you selected all the right answers and never showed me any work on your piece of paper, you just turn in a blank piece of paper, um, then you're going to have a 10 on the test, even though you had 100 before I started grading it. Okay, so be mindful that selecting the right answer only gets you one point. That's it. Okay, the next um, part in the rubric was the notation. That's what the N stands for. Okay, and so for here, you either had one point or zero points, one point or two points. That's how much the notation was worth. So if you're not, if you're writing, um, like let's say I'm trying to multiply this out and you're writing it like this, this is not correct notation, okay? You need to be writing it all in one line, okay? So, I just need to make sure that you actually know how to write things out mathematically. Also, I had a couple of students just turning in a bunch of chicken scratch and not actually writing equivalent lines and showing me the logic, showing me their process, just a bunch of scribble on the paper, okay? That's not gonna give you notation points either. That is not what you're supposed to be turning in. I tried to mention that before, but I still, it's, it's a learning process, I know. Um, I still have people not, they're not numbering their problems, they're not numbering their pages, they're not um, writing down work for every single problem. And then of course I addressed it in the last video, 
in the last lecture class that um, some students were just checking answers instead of actually writing the solution. Okay, there's a difference. Um, and then the last little box here, E stands for your explanation. So did you explain what you were doing and how you got your answer thoroughly and properly? Now, I was super lenient on this test because it's the first one, okay? But I will be more strict when it comes to you explaining what you're doing. You can't just write the problem and then write the answer and not tell me how you got that answer. It doesn't have to be mathematical symbols for you to explain how you got that answer. You can write in a word, I distributed. I applied this property. I did this, I did that. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, a bunch of steps and all of the process, okay? Um, I factored by trial and error, especially if you just wrote the problem down and then wrote the answer. Tell me, I factored it by trial and error. I guessed and checked, that's what I did, that was my process of factoring. That is a legitimate process. Now, taking the answers you were given and checking all of those is not the process of trial and error, okay? So you have to keep that distinguishment. I choose to make the test multiple choice to kind of help you and guide you on what the solution should look like so that you know when you're done with the problem, right? Um, I could eliminate that completely and make them open-ended, but I promise you that's going to make it a lot harder on you to figure out the solutions, okay? Because at least if you have the choices there, you have an idea of what it's supposed to look like. Whereas if you have nothing, that is, you have a higher chance of just um, freezing up or blocking and not, not knowing what to do next, okay? And I, I don't want that to happen. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of the little notation that you see. And then you'll also see another number in a circle. That's the total amount of points that you get for that problem, OK? So I might have the little table there. And I'll say one, two, and seven. Then you get all 10 points for that problem, OK? Um, if there's different numbers here, I basically add them up together to get the total points for that particular problem. And then your grade. Um, depends on all those points. However, I knew, I mentioned that in the last lecture, that there were going to be a lot of zeros. And there were. I had about four zeros in this class and about four zeros in the last class, which is surprisingly low from my expectation. Because normally people make a whole bunch of mistakes on the first go round. Um, and so there's usually a lot more zeros than just four. But I think because we have a smaller class, maybe that's why we only had um, four people that still didn't quite understand what was going on. So the reason why some of the people got zeros is one, they didn't upload their paperwork within the 30 minutes. I think out of all eight zeros for both classes, only one student didn't upload their paperwork within 30 minutes, which is not good for them, but great as a whole, because that means that I've conveyed <laughs> the importance of you guys um, uploading that paperwork on time. And I also noticed that a lot of you were able to do it in less than or around six minutes. So that's fantastic also. I'm glad you're not having a problem with that process. Well, most of you are not having a problem with that process. So that was the reason one of the, the eight people got a zero. I think I had two people that got a zero because they did not show their ID when setting up the respondus. The respondus makes you take a photo. So you just stand in front of the camera or sit in front of the camera and click snap, right? Click the button to take the photo. Then you're going to, uh, next step is to show the ID. So you show the ID to the camera, get close enough so that I can actually see your face and your name um, and then snap another photo. There were two, two people that did not do their photo ID, which means I can't verify your identity and therefore I can't count your test score because I don't know that it's whoever's in my class is the one actually taking the test. I can't verify that, okay? So there were two people of the eight that got a zero for not showing the ID. And then I think the remaining I think the remaining folks were for the environment check. Either you showed me all around the room, but then never showed me your desk area. 
So I couldn't tell whether or not you had the right calculator or if you had a book and notes on your desk, I couldn't tell because you never showed me your desk or you showed me your desk, but you didn't show me the room. So I couldn't verify that there wasn't anyone else in the room that could be telling you all the answers. Then um, I had like two people that didn't do an environment check at all. They literally just sat there in front of the camera and smiled and then took the test. Um, that's not okay, right? Uh, you must show that environment check, okay? So that's really all of the zeros that were accounted for were for one of those three reasons. No ID, uh, no proper um, environment check, or you turned in your paperwork late, okay? Um, and, and those are all in the test policy. So there's no surprise there that a zero was awarded for those kinds of errors or oversights because it, I mean, I've tried to preach <laughs> about the test policy as much as I could just to ensure that you were all aware so nobody made those mistakes, okay? Um, and I've shown in the video where to find that feedback. I also wanna show one more thing because the only test that we've taken is for the three, um, the 314 class, the developmental part of our two courses, right? Because we are taking two courses. It's just most of everything we do is inside the Canvas course 1414, right? That's where I put everything. That's where um, everything is at, right? I put everything all up in there. So because of that, you do have to go to the 314 class. So depending on which section you're in, the face-to-face -face or the online, if you click on the 314 class, then you can go to your grade book. Let me go to student view. And again, you might have, I probably don't have it because I don't remember putting in scores, but you should have a score here for your web assign assignment average. And then you should have a score here for your test score. Okay. So whatever your score was after I test it. Oh, that's another thing. There were rules, right? For your paperwork. Like you had to write your um, page numbers at the top of the page. You had to number all the problems. You had to do all the problems in order. You had to make sure that your scans were not too light or too blurry where I couldn't read them. Um, and any one of those rules, if you, if you missed it, then it was a five point deduction. That's explained in the paperwork um, assignment. Okay? So if you saw that, then you saw a five point deduction, it was for one of those things. And I explain all of that on your paper, okay? But I just wanted to make you aware you do, you are gonna find your scores in the 314 class so that you can get your 314 grade, okay? The tests are worth 50% um, of your developmental grade, and then the web assign assignments are worth 50% of the um, developmental grade. Now, I know that the first one was a learning experience, and you know whether you were in the face-to-face -face or the online, and I also know that eventually we are going to go back for the face-to-face -face class. We are going to go back in person and actually be face-to-face. So we may not have any of those same issues in the future that we had on this test, but for the online folks, it's going to be the same process for every single test. And there's nine of them. So we have eight left. Um, so you're going to keep repeating this process. So hopefully for the online students, they're not making those same errors um, as we progress throughout the semester. And that way they're not getting any more zeros. Um, so if you did get a zero on this test, what I'm going to do is whatever score you get on your, um, and it, it'll be the same for anyone and everyone, okay? Regardless if you got a zero or if you didn't like this score, or maybe you just do better in the future. Um, whatever you score on the first 1414 test, that's the first college level test. Whatever you score on that test, if it is a higher score than your developmental unit A test, then I will replace that test score, okay? So for my face-to-face, -face, if you weren't fantastic at trying to maneuver around all this internet stuff, um, 
and you feel like you would do better, you know, in a face-to-face -face environment. And if we are face-to-face -face by the time we get to um, the unit one test, then that'll kind of compensate for whatever happened on this test. And I want to extend that same opportunity to all my online class too. So whatever score you get on that first unit one 14, 14 test, it'll replace the unit A test. Okay. And that helps a little bit, especially if you have some pressure because you're like, oh no, I have zero because I did this or that. Um, it's not so scary. Okay. But that grade replacement is not going to happen for every single test. So you, you have to use this this um, experience as a learning experience, okay? You do need to um, learn from this and so that we don't do that again on the next test, okay? Because the next test will stick. By that point, I am hoping that everyone has figured out how the things are gonna work and they don't make any of those mistakes anymore, okay? Um, as for today's class, I believe we finished the exponents, or I'm sorry, the radicals part of the P.2, but we do need to continue with the um, exponent part of the uh, P.2. So let me go back. I clicked on the wrong button. I'm trying to pull up the workbook. And if you have any questions about your grade, please re read the feedback before you ask me questions about your grade because I'm literally gonna tell you to go read the paper. But if after you've read your paper and you see all my comments and you're still confused about something, message me, okay? You can message me in email, you can message me in um, Remind either way. Um, and I'll real, I will respond at some point today, as soon as I can, of course, but um, I'm not sure when everyone's going to be messaging me when y'all have time to review it and then finally message me about it. Okay, it's taking a little while, sorry. And I did figure out how to get my camera on here. Um, I just had to download a program so that I can show you my, my paper. Because I did not like having to write on the screen. That was not fun yesterday. Um, okay, here we have integer exponents. We did all that. Where did we leave off the radicals? Simplifying. Rationalizing. And I think we were here. Rational exponents is where we left off, OK? So for the definition of a rational exponent, it basically just means your exponents can now have fractions, OK? And if they have decimals, you can convert those decimals into fractions. We know how to do that on our calculator. You just press that little double arrow, right? And then it will tell you. Um, what that decimal looks like as a fraction, okay? But for the most part, they're all going to have fractions. Now, here's the um, short notation how to write it, where if you have one over a number, that denominator becomes your index of the radical. So the big idea here is that a rational exponent, a fraction exponent, will turn that expression into a radical expression. So you go from exponential form to radical form, okay? They do have a, a, a relationship there, okay? And the relationship is equivalent to one another. And so notice that it just has the nth root of a. And the reason that is, is because one, the numerator, is actually the exponent of a whereas n was the index of the radical, okay? And we know that when we write a to the power one, we don't ever write that power one, right? That's why you see that the one is kind of gone. It's there, it's just invisible, okay? So what if it's not a one in the numerator? What if you actually have another number in the numerator and a number in the denominator? 
Well, then in that case, it can equal two different things, okay? The first one is that it could be the nth root of a, and then the exponent could be outside the radical. Or you can put the n with the, as the index of the radical, and then the numerator becomes the exponent inside the radical. It is completely your choice on which way you write it, okay? Typically, I like to use the last um, version here, the one where the exponent is inside the radical. That's the one I usually um, convert to, but it is helpful to know that it can be either way, okay? So here they're just converting it over and they're just letting you know that regardless of which way you're doing it, the denominator is the index of the radical. The numerator is going to be the power or the exponent, okay? So here are some examples. We know that if we were trying to um, simplify this expression here, because the bases are both two, we are allowed to use our exponent property that says we can add those exponents together, which is what they've done there. And then when you add one half and one third, you end up with five six. Um, and if you're trying to find a decimal answer, you can literally type that in your calculator just like that and get a decimal answer. However, a lot of times the computer is going to ask you for an exact answer, meaning they don't want you to give them a decimal because you're gonna to have to round that decimal at some point and they don't want a rounded answer. They want the actual answer, okay? And so you have to be able to simplify that expression if it can be simplified, okay? And so that's one of the reasons why we have to learn this conversion so that we do know how to write these as radicals, okay? Um, so here's some examples and I'm gonna just walk through them because they are already written here. So notice that you have this negative 32 in parentheses, okay? Which means that entire thing is the base, okay? And then you have this exponent on the outside and it's a fraction exponent. So you can rewrite this and they chose to put, of course you have to put the five, the denominator as the index. So notice the little five down here is now the index of the radical. We don't have a choice on that. It, that has to be the case. Your choice lies in whether you wanna put the numerator as an exponent inside the radical or if you wanna do it as an exponent outside the radical. That part is completely up to you, okay? And so I'm actually gonna do it on paper the other way after I talk this one out, okay? So let me write down the problem real quick so that I don't forget it. Okay, so remember, they chose to put the power, the numerator outside, that's fine. When they type um, the fifth root of negative 32 in their calculator, they get negative two, okay? And you can type that in your calculator. And I have no idea why, but I completely forgot my calculator. So let me go to another window and write scientific calculator. Um, I may be able to find, um, what is it, the TI? 36 Pro, I wanna find an emulator. Oh, I don't think it's gonna let me use the 36 Pro. I think it's gonna make me, um, at least it'll let me see it. You know what, let me, let me not do that. I just want the image so I can show you which buttons to push to find the fifth root of something, okay? You can type it in your calculator and to figure out how to do it, but let me just make it large so that we can see which buttons we need to push, okay? Normally it'll make it real big. There you go. Oh, nope. Okay, 
So I don't know if you can see it, but to the left of the seven, I can't click on it because then um, the image will go away. But to the left of the seven, you see an X squared button. And above that is a regular square root, right? And that's normally what you use when you're typing in square roots. But if you notice above that, it has X with a box. That means you can type in any exponent. It doesn't have to just be two, it could be any exponent, okay? And if you notice above that button in blue, it has a box and then a square root, okay? That button right there lets you type in any kind of root. It doesn't have to be a square root. It can be a fifth root. It could be a eighth root. It could be any kind of root, a cube root, right? Um, the trick is, though, is for you to type in the number, the index of that root first. So for me, and you can try it on your calculator right now, you would type in five first because our index was five. Then you would hit the second button, which is the little blue button at the top left. And then you would hit that button that has the X with the box. And what it will do on your calculator, and you'll notice because it happens super fast, is that as soon as you click second and then that X to the box button, it automatically puts the root and it makes that five real tiny in the index, okay? And so it just puts it in there as the index for you. And then your cursor should be blinking inside of the radical. And then inside there, you can type in negative 32 and make sure you're using the negative button, which is to the left of the enter and not the minus button, which is to the right of the nine, okay? So there's two different buttons. There's minus and then there's negative. The negative is the one at the bottom with the little parentheses around it. So inside you would use that button negative and then 32 and then you would hit enter and it would tell you in a calculator that the answer is negative two okay so that's what they did over here um i just i really wish i hadn't forgotten my calculator on campus um the buildings are closed so i can't even go run in and grab it real quick um it's just stuck okay um i don't want to do that yet i want to go back here Okay, so that's where this negative two that they have inside the parentheses came from. They just stuck all of that radical stuff inside the calculator and figured out that it was negative two. Then they still need to apply this negative four power. So when they do that, remember what I talked about in the last class, a negative exponent just means that it changes places in a fraction. So since this was not a fraction originally, you can make it a fraction by putting it over one. And then to make that negative exponent go away, the whole expression has to now go downstairs. So then it's negative two and it becomes a positive four. Notice that the base does not change signs when you move it downstairs. The only thing that changed signs is the exponent. The negative exponent is what makes it move downstairs. And when it moves, make sure that you change it to positive, okay? Then you can type in your calculator using that X with the little box button. You can type in parentheses, negative two, close parentheses, then hit that button that had the X with the box and it'll, it'll lift the cursor and make it real tiny. And then you can hit type in a four and hit enter and you'll notice that you'll get 16. So you end up with the response one over 16. Now be mindful you can type in this whole thing in the calculator. You could even type this whole thing in the calculator, the problem they gave you. But what's going to happen in the directions on the homework and in the directions on the test is it's going to say, do it without the calculator. And I know that you're using the calculator for the fifth root, and I'm okay with that. But I, what I want to know is I want to know that you know how to convert this to its radical form and that you know how to apply all of those properties for the exponents, okay? That's what's gonna be super important. Now, let me show you what would have happened if I would have done it the other way, because it is all about choice, okay? Remember, they chose to do it this way. They chose to do the radical with the negative 32 on the inside and then the negative four on the outside. But we know that that is equivalent, there we go. 
we know that that is equivalent to five as the index and then negative 32 to the negative fourth power. These are both equivalent. Now, here's why they chose this way instead of the other way. Because if I go a few steps, okay, remember that negative exponent is going to kick the whole expression downstairs. So it's going to become negative 32 to the positive fourth power. And then, of course, you always have a one in the top when there was no fraction to begin with. Then what's not so great is when you type in negative 32 to the fourth power in your calculator, and that I am going to do. Um, parentheses. Do, 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 do. I think I have to do negative 32. The computer one works different. And then I'm going to go exponent four. Notice you get this humongous number. Now, there's nothing wrong with humongous numbers. They're just not friendly, right? Um, let me go back. Where am I? There we go. You get this giant number. And then you're supposed to take the fifth root of that, OK? Now, I, I'm going to use some more properties. So I'm going to split that root into the fifth root of one and then the fifth root of that weird number. Now, if you type this in your calculator using that button that I showed you, you're going to get one. If you type this in the calculator using that little button, you're going to get 16. OK, and you can verify. Try typing it in there and see if you actually get 16. You should, I'm going to check my answer only because this calculator doesn't do all that. But if I were to do 16 raised to the fifth, oh, that didn't do it. 16 raised to the fifth, I get that weird number, OK? So the fifth root of this weird number is 16. And notice that this answer is the exact same answer that they got. OK, it's just we did it a little bit differently and both of them are completely acceptable. OK, but I understand that you are going to use the calculator to find those fifth roots. OK, I get that. That's not what we mean when we say don't use the calculator. OK, it means don't just take this and go in the calculator and tell me that the answer is one over 16. OK, that's what we're saying because it is possible to put that in the calculator and get this answer. What we're trying to do is see if you remember all of those exponent rules, because as soon as we throw variables in here, you can't put variables in later. And so we want you to practice with the numbers because you can always check your answers in the calculator. But we don't want you to solely rely on the calculator because then as soon as we throw letters in there, you won't know what to do, okay? So the next problem has this problem here. And so we do what we do before. We take the numbers, the coefficients, and we just multiply the coefficients together, and we get the negative 15. Now, the variables, you have this x to the 5 over 3 times x to the negative 3 over 4. You do need to add those two together. Remember, if you add a negative number, it's the same as subtraction, which is why they've written 5 thirds minus 3 fourths. You can type that computation in your calculator if you can't do it on paper or you know in your brain. Um, and you will get the exponent of 11 over 2. And there's nothing else to do with that unless they did want you to put that in radical form. Then that answer in radical form, let's see what that would look like. So you have negative 15 x to the 11 over 12. So then if I wanted to put that in radical form, notice this is not in parentheses. So that means that that exponent does not apply to everything. The only thing it applies to is exactly what it's attached to. And that exponent is attached to the X. So the 15 has nothing to do with that expression. 
your brain should be thinking of it like this, okay? It's the coefficient times this um, expression that has the fraction exponent. So it's only this part that I'm going to convert to the radical. Now remember, the denominator becomes your index, and then the numerator becomes your exponent. And this is the way I like to write it. But again, there is nothing saying that you can't write it like this. Those are both completely correct, okay? They are both correct. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. They're perfectly okay. This one to me just looks cleaner. And so this is the one I usually go with when I'm writing my final answers, okay? Okay, part C is literally just converting over to your radical form. So, or for of your exponent form. So notice that the index is nine, right? And the exponent is three. So index has to go in the denominator right there. And then the exponent becomes your numerator. And you can reduce three ninths. If you type three ninths as a fraction in your calculator and you hit enter, it will reduce it and tell you it's one third. And then just go back and put it back into um, radical form. So three is now the index and one is now the exponent. And we already know we don't write one exponents, okay? Here, they skipped <laughs> a couple of steps there. Let me do D on paper because they just go straight into the answer and it's a little more complicated than that, okay? So for this one, I'm gonna go from the inside outward, okay? I am gonna go from the inside outward. Now, on the inside, this radical square root of 125 can be written as a power. And so we know that when there's no index, that it's automatically a two. And we also know that when there's no power, that it's automatically a one. So when I convert this into exponent form, it's gonna be 125 to the one half, okay? Now we're gonna convert the outside radical to exponent form. So I have all of this inside the radical and, and actually, no, you can do it this way. So the index here, I'm just gonna keep 125 as my base. Okay. Um, the index here is three, so that has to be my denominator but the exponent is one half, okay? And you can type a double fraction in your calculator. If you don't want to, you can type in 0 0.5 over three if you feel more comfortable with not typing double, cap, uh, double fractions. Um, but when you do that, you are gonna get 125 in fraction form to the one six, okay? And if I convert that back to radical form, six is the index, and then one is the exponent, okay? Which is what they had on the paper, but they didn't show you how they got from here to here, okay? So I wanted you to know that there was a process, they are applying those rules. Once they did that, it's just a matter of simplifying the, um, the sixth root, okay? And so they noticed that if you were to do the tree for 125, I'm gonna, jump over here. If I do the tree for 125, I get five times 25, I get five times five, which means I get the sixth root of five times five times five. We know another way to write that, and that's exponent form. When you've got three fives multiplied together, you can write it as five to the third power. So you don't have to know this, that this is the case. You can find out what you're gonna get by doing your prime tree, okay? So I just want you to be aware, if you don't recognize that that's five cubed, do your prime tree and you'll figure it out, okay? 
But if I convert this back to exponent form, I'm going to have the index at the bottom and the exponent at the top. And that can be reduced and it reduces to one half. And we know that one half can actually be written as the square root of five. Remember, this is the two and this is the one, but we don't ever write those. They're invisible, okay? So lots and lots and lots of rules. They are skipping some steps and I wanna make sure that you have all the steps. It's like if they show you something once way in the past, then they just assume you know what they're doing now. But I like to see everything. So I try to fill in the little gaps whenever they have them, okay? And if you type square root of five in your calculator, it's not, it's gonna give you a decimal or it's gonna just spit back a square root of five, meaning that it cannot be reduced, okay? So square root of five is just the answer. Oh, good. Now they're getting into more complex um, expressions. So now you have 2x minus 1 to exponent of thirds. You have 2x minus 1 with the exponent of negative 1 thirds. The bases are the same here. And anytime that the bases are the same, if you're multiplying, all you need to do is add the exponents. So remember that adding a negative 1 third is the same as subtracting 1 third. So all they've written for the exponent here is the 4 thirds minus the 1 third. And if you type 4 thirds minus 1 third in your calculator, you'll get 1, okay? And we already know that we don't write the exponent 1. So ideally, um, if I annotate on this real quick, just once, this should be in parentheses with the power 1. But we know that we don't ever write the exponent one and therefore I don't need the parentheses if there's no exponent. And so that's why the answer is just this, okay? You don't need to write these things. They are, sometimes you get, um, I don't know whether they call them smart Alex or geniuses or what, but <laughs> sometimes you'll get, well, hey, you know, if x were to equal one half, then I wouldn't be able to do this because that negative means that this expression is in the denominator. And if x is one half, then that means I'm going to have zero in the denominator and zero is undefined. So how are we doing this problem if that's undefined for a certain x value, right? And the way that mathematicians get around that is they try to eliminate that possibility by telling you, well, x can't equal this number. So you're not going to happen. OK, um, but you don't need to think about that. Whenever you're writing the answers, you don't ever have to put this information down. Normally, WebAssign will put that information down for you or they'll have a statement in the problem itself, something of the nature like assume that X is positive real number. And then that way, you know, you're never going to have zero. And if you're taking an even route, you know, you'll never get an imaginary answer. You will get a real a real number. OK. Um, so, and then that's all this is saying down here is that if you notice, I don't know why there's a one there, there should not be a one there. Um, but if you notice when X is equal to 12, this expression right there will be zero to the negative one power, which is actually one over zero to the one third. And then zero to the one third is zero. And we know that this is undefined. Okay. Oh God, I hate using this little thing, but I just need to finish this one word. Okay. So that's why they're saying X cannot equal two. But again, you don't have to remember that. You don't need to write that down anywhere. For most of the problems, it's going to say, assume that all the variables are, um, represent positive real numbers. Okay. So then here's the practice. They want us to simplify these radical expressions. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and go over to the paper so that we can try them. We do have um, five examples. I don't anticipate that it's gonna take me a whole hour to go over these five examples. Um, so I'm not sure yet whether I wanna jump into the 1.5 lesson or whether I should just table that. 
until we come back from the weekend. Now 1.5 is not too long. We should be able to cover that in time. So I'll just leave that one for, um, not Monday. Monday's a holiday, right? It's Labor Day. Um, but I have a question. Sure. Do we have class Monday? No, it's Labor yeah. Day. The okay. whole campus is closed. Um, however, I am assuming that we are meeting face-to-face -face on Tuesday. So the next time we have class, I'm assuming that I'm going to actually physically see you people. Um, I have not heard anything otherwise. And if we don't hear anything otherwise, then we are coming back on Tuesday, okay? If I get a message today or tomorrow that says, no, we're not, I am going to send a, I'm gonna have to blast it everywhere. So I'm gonna send it in an ACES email. I'm gonna send it in a Canvas email. I'm gonna send it in the Remind texting, but I'm gonna try to make sure I cover all my bases so that everyone is aware that you do actually have to physically come to class on Tuesday. And if you don't, I will let you know as well, okay? <laughs> Make sure you don't come to class because we do need to be on online in the computer on, Mon on not Monday, Tuesday. Um, but I will definitely send out something no later than tomorrow because by tomorrow, 5 p.m., they should have told me what I'm doing on Tuesday, okay? But as it stands now, I've gone to the school's COVID-19 link and right now it's still saying that classes are gonna resume face-to-face um on the i think it's the eighth that we're gonna come back on the on the seventh actually so we should be coming back on the seventh but good question <laughs> i will keep you posted for all of you in this face-to-face -face class um, for the online class there's a room capacity so the online people are um it is possible for some of them to come to the class, but I can't go over the uh, room capacity because we are supposed to um, still keep our social distancing and all of that inside the classroom. So I have to find out how many people we have that are going to be in the class because a lot of people have already been dropping. If this class goes really fast because you're doing two classes in one semester, right? Um, so I have had a couple of people drop, so I don't know how many people I'm actually going to have on Tuesday yet. I have to do the tallies. And then I need to figure out what the room capacity is. And then once I know that difference, that's how many online students can be invited to come to the class um, with us. Not that they will. Most of them are not going to want to wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning or earlier than 8 o'clock in the morning and come to an 8 o'clock class. Um, because they signed up for an online class for a reason, right? But for the face-to-face -face, uh, folks, for your attendance, you will, you do need to actually be in class, okay? Also, because uh, if we go back on Tuesday, there's a whole bunch of other things that have, that come with that because of COVID. So um, the masks are not uh, quote-unquote required, but everywhere in the paperwork, it's like, it's strongly, with strongly in all caps, <laughs> encouraged, right? Um, so no one's going to deny you access. However, if you do come to the building without a mask, they will hand you a mask, okay? Um, now, whether you put it on or not, that's up to you, but they are going to do what they can to ensure that they've provided you with the safety materials, okay? Um, I'm going to be wearing a mask. They gave me a face shield to wear, but I think that's too much. Um, but that's just me, you know, everybody has their own thing that they're doing or that they believe in right now with all of this going on. Um, I'm not going to wear the face shield, but I am going to be wearing a mask. So when you see me in class, I will wear a mask and then we will keep the social distancing. So just like I'm doing Zoom right now with you, um, I will be doing Zoom, not Zoom, sort of. Yeah, it's Zoom. I will be using Zoom to record what's going on in the class. And I will be using a, um, oh, what is it called? The projector screen. So like the screen that comes down in the front of the class. So everything that you see on the computer, when we get to class, you're gonna see it on the screen, okay? The only difference is, is that one, I get to see y'all. And if y'all have faces of confusion, I can address it. 
Um, I can't do that in here, especially when all y'all have y'all's cameras off. I don't know when someone's confused <laughs> or if like something I'm saying doesn't make sense. Um, but when I see you and I see your face or your eyebrows, you know, doing some funny stuff, then I know like I lost you and I need to, you know, clarify. Um, so it does help to be in that face-to-face -face environment. It also, you'll be able to still chime in and ask your questions as you, um, as we keep going, like we've done already. But maybe if you're in person, you might be more inclined to ask more questions. Um, so that's always a bonus too. Um, I just want to kind of give you guys a heads up that I am going to be doing the same stuff I'm doing here. It's just, it'll be on a screen and we'll be in person. Okay. Um, when it comes to these practice problems, I will not do them in the class. Right now I'm doing them with you because we're in the Zoom session. Okay. But in the class period, I will give you time to do these practice problems. And then I will pause the recording for the online students so they're not just sitting there waiting for you guys to do the problems. Um, I will pause the recording for them. And then once everyone's like finished, I will post the solutions on the screen and unpause the video, right? Um, so that everyone can check to see what they did, if they got it wrong or anything like that. If COVID was not a thing, I could go walk by every single one of you and then double check your paper, correct you where you're making a mistake. I can't do that because of the social distancing policies on the campus. Um, so I'll just give you time to try it. It's better to try and fail and understand how and where you failed and fix it the next time than to not try at all. You won't learn anything from not trying at all, okay? So just to give you an idea of how the dynamics are gonna change a tiny bit, but not too much, okay? It'll essentially be kind of the same type of instruction, okay? Okay, let me write these problems down and then we will go over to the paper so that we can try to work these out. So there's five, I think there was five examples. There might be more, but I don't think it's gonna take us too long to figure it out. Okay, let me go to my camera. So for here, we have practice one, which just says the square root of 125. Now, normally, whatever that number is on the inside, you would do the prime tree. I already did it, so I already know what it is. Um, but five is a prime number. And on the test, I will put prime numbers. I will just only go up to like 29. I won't go any further than 29 because typically we don't see prime numbers that high. Um, but if you forget what your prime numbers are, there will be a list in the note sheet for that test, okay? Um, what else? So then I'm gonna write this as the square root of five times five times five. And we already know that when we're doing the square root, we need a pair. Why do we need a pair? Because the index is an invisible two when there's nothing written. So I do need a pair in order for one of these fives to come out. So it's like they meld together and then you just get one big five that comes out, okay? This one is left over and it's left over on the inside. And there's no nothing else you can do with that. That's as far as it's going to simplify, okay? Now, number two over here, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna break up this 40. Um, it's an even number, so I know two goes into there. And then 20 is also an even number. 10 is also an even number. And now I'm stuck with all primes. So these are all my prime numbers. So this becomes the cube root of two times two times two times five. And then my index is three this time. So that means I need a group of three in order for one of them to come out. And this guy is gonna be left over on the inside. And my one, two on the outside. Oh, it's got a glare there. There we go. So this is what I mean by showing your work. 
okay? That, you know, you need to explain what's going on. Like, you're going to write 40 equals this, but how do you know it equals that? Well, this tree over here shows me how you know. And then you go from this to this. Well, how? How did you go from that to that? This step, grouping them, telling me that a two is going to come out, and then telling me what's going to be left over, that's explaining everything that you're doing, okay? And that's what I mean by your explanations. You can use symbols or you can use words. You could write a whole paragraph if you wanted to. Um, I prefer to do symbols just because they're faster and easier. And I'm a visual person. Not everyone is a visual person, but I am. And so that's how I usually show my steps in my work. Okay, we've got this one. It's a little bit bigger, but it's nothing different. It's the same process. I do have a coefficient. So whatever comes out is gonna have to get multiplied by that four, okay? Now, I don't know about 192, and I think this was an 81 if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check, I think I typed that wrong. Yeah, it was an 81. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do a tree. I'm gonna do it in another color just so um, this is like my side work. So 92 is an even number. So I am going to divide it by two. And then that would give me um, nine and then a one. Is that right? No, nine and a six. Can somebody do 192 in a calculator divided by two? I think it's 96, but I just want to be sure before I keep going. It's 96. It is? Okay, good. <laughs> I don't want to keep going and be wrong because I don't have a calculator. Um, okay, and then 96 is also still even. So I'm going to divide by two again. And I get 48. Still an even number. So I'm going to divide by two again. I get 24. Still even. Still even. And still even. So this one's got a lot of prime numbers. We've got one, two, three, four, five twos, nope, six twos and a three. So when I come over here, I'm gonna write one, two, three, four, five, six twos, a three. And then of course you have the three X's, right? Over here, for the 81, it's not even. So normally the next number I try is three if it's not an even number. But 81 is one of those numbers that's on our times table chart. And so if you know your times tables, your brain is probably screaming nine times nine is 81, right? And there's nothing wrong with breaking it up with nine times nine. If that's what comes to your mind first, then do it, okay? Just make sure that it actually multiplies to give you what you start with. But nine is not a prime number. When I give you the list of primes, you're gonna notice it jumps from seven all the way to 11. So nine is not a prime, which means it can be broken up. And this is also a common multiplication table. So your brain's probably telling you three times three, and that's okay. And three is a prime. So I literally am done and all my ends are right there. So I have one, two, three, four, and then an X, an X, and an X. I did switch colors there, my apologies. I'll go back. So I need groups of three. So we have one group of three, and we have two groups of three, and we have a third group of three. So this group is gonna come out as a two. This group is gonna come out as another two. And this group is going to come out as an X. What I'm left over with is that extra three. Now let's do the same thing on the other side. So this group of three is going to come out as a three. This group of three is going to come out as a single X. And this three is going to be left over on the inside. And I'm just going to multiply all this together. So that's 16 X cube root of three plus three X cube root of three. 
Now remember, we can only combine them if they are truly like terms. So not only do you have to make sure that um, the indexes and the radicands are exactly the same, we also have to make sure that the variables and the variable exponents are the same. So you have x here with an invisible one exponent. You have x here with an invisible one exponent. I know that three is real close to it and it looks like it's x cubed, but it's not. That three is the index of the radical. It has nothing to do with this x anymore, okay? They do match. They both have x, they both have cube root of three. So how many of these weird x cube root of threes do I have? Just add the coefficients. 16 plus three is 19 of these x cube root of threes. So this one was pretty, a big one. I don't wanna say it's like super common, but this is like the challenging problem of the problems, okay? Let me go back and see what the next problem looks like. I think, what is going on there? I think I just forgot to change the numbers. So there's seven um, problems, not five. So number four says rationalize the denominator. So this is good. This is recalling what we had the last time and then eventually we'll get to the stuff we've been doing today. It's always good to re-process um, what we did the other day. So this one wants us to rationalize the denominator. Now remember you have a cube root. Remember what rationalizing means first. Rationalizing means to get rid of the radical. And the only way I can get rid of the radical is if I have three fives and then the whole group can come out. And if all of it comes out, then there's no more reason to write the radical because there'd be nothing in it, right? But I only have one five here. In order for me to get three fives, I'm going to have to multiply by two more, okay? But whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do the same thing to the top so that all I'm doing is multiplying by a really weird looking one. And when you multiply by one, it doesn't change the value of the expression. So then this expression is equivalent to the next line, okay? So I'm gonna have 125 and then the cube root of five times five in the numerator. In the denominator, because they're both radicals with the same index, you can write them using that property, all of them together under one house because they all have the same index. And then now we know that once we have a group of three, it can come out. And so this becomes a five. There's no more fives, nothing left on the inside of the radical. So you do not need to write the inside of the radical anymore. But I do need to reduce this. And here's the big one. You cannot reduce something that is not in a radical with something that is in a radical. So don't ever try to cancel one of these fives with that five downstairs because one is in a radical on top and the other is not in a radical on the bottom. Okay. So, and you definitely wouldn't want to cancel them here because then you're literally going backwards and you're going to end up with what you started with, okay? But once I've got it there, these are the ones that can reduce. And five goes into 125, 25 times, and five goes into five, one time. So then I have 25 cube root, five times five is 25. I could have done that at any point in time I just chose to do it at the end. And you never have to write over one. You can just write the whole number. Okay, give me one moment. Resume, okay. 
So for number five, they want us to rationalize our denominator again. And remember the concept, we're trying to get rid of that little square root symbol. Now we know that when we have two terms down there though, we have to use what's called the conjugate. So the square root of 15 stays the same and the three stays the same. The only thing that changes with the con conjugates is the sign in the middle. So instead of minus in the middle, we're gonna have plus in the middle. And whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do the same thing to the top. So we're just multiplying by a really weird looking one. Now, what is that gonna look like? It's gonna look like this on paper. Now, if you recognize that this is half of the difference of squares formula, you can apply that rule, okay? But some people are not going to recognize it and that's okay, you can still do the problem successfully, okay? So for me, I know that when I have one number times two numbers, I have to distribute. Now I could either write the word distribute or I can show these little arrows correctly and I have indicated what I'm doing. I've explained to you what I'm doing to get this next line. So three is on the outside and square root of 15 is on the inside. Remember, you cannot divide or multiply insides with outsides. But neither one of these threes is inside a radical, so I can multiply those together. At the bottom, we have to FOIL this out or distribute this out. So I'm gonna take this square root of 15 and multiply it to that. I get square root of 15 squared because 15 times 15 is 15 squared. I get this times this, which is positive three square root of 15. Then I have negative three times this one. That gives me negative three square root of 15. And then finally, I can do negative three times positive three, which gives me negative nine. And then notice that the positive three square root of 15 and the negative three square root of 15 will cancel. As long as one is positive and one is negative, um, then they will cancel. And also remember that when you have a square root and a square, they undo each other. So this is just 15. And 15 minus nine, I believe is six. And I can reduce this. So if I were to take actually all three terms, and it does have to apply to all three terms in order for you to reduce this kind of fraction. Is there a GCF for all three terms? including the one term downstairs. So this is one term, three square root of 15. This is one term and the six is one term. And for me, I noticed that all of them can be divided by three. So I'm gonna factor out a three in the numerator and I'm gonna factor out a three in the denominator. And then these three do reduce and you end up with the square root of 15 plus three over two. Now, normally you would try to see if this 15 can reduce, but it can't because 15 only breaks up into three times five. And there's that means I would be doing the square root of three times five, but the index is two and I don't have any groups of two. Okay, so that cannot be simplified. I would try, but it doesn't work. And so I'm stuck with this as my final answer. Okay, let me go back to the other screen so I can get, and this whole process is super important to practice because when we get to imaginaries, it's gonna be sort of the same thing. Um, you'll see it when we get there, but. I promise it's very, very similar when we get to imaginaries. Super similar. Might be easier with the imaginaries, but it's still very similar to the process. Okay, 
they're saying this is the second number four, but I'm going to call it number six. And then the second number five, but I'm going to call it number seven. So they want me to simplify both of these expressions. So for the first one, this is x to the fourth. There's not really much to do with that. So I'm just going to keep it as an x to the fourth. However, this can be rewritten in its exponent form. And so when I write it in its exponent form, the index becomes the denominator and the exponent becomes the numerator. And we know that when we multiply things with the same base, we add the exponents. So this becomes four plus two thirds. Now you can add that in your calculator, but you should get 14 over three. And depending on the computer, sometimes they just want you to give them the um, exponent form. Sometimes it might actually say rational exponent form, meaning fraction exponent form, okay? And this would be it. And then sometimes, they'll specify, okay? But sometimes if they give you the answer with a radical in it, they usually expect your answer with a radical, okay? And so then I would have to convert that back to a three index and an X to the 14th. And we already know that if we have X to the 14th, this can reduce, okay? So, I'm, I don't want to sit here and draw 14 of these things, but I am going to group them in threes. So I have three. If I have three more, that's six. If I have three more, that's nine. If I have three more, that's 12. And then that would only give me two left to get 14, right? This just prevents me from having to write X, 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 all the way till I write 14 of them, okay? So this group of three is gonna come out as one. This group of three is gonna come out as another. This group of three is gonna come out as another. And this group of three is gonna come out as another. But this is not a full group of three. So this one is going to stay stuck in the inside. One, two, three, four. So that can be written as X to the fourth. Oh, I just went backwards, didn't I? Which is not bad because now you have an example of what happens when you have this and they ask you to reduce it, okay? But just keep in mind that either this will be your answer if they want it in rational exponent form, or this will be your answer if they want it in radical form. Because there are a few problems in the homework that make you go back and forth between the rational exponent form and the radical form. So it's not a bad idea to have that. And if somebody did give me this problem, at least you have a way to do it when the exponent is really, really high, like 14, okay? Now we'll do number seven, which is our last one. Um, dun, dun, dun. So this one does have a negative exponent. And we already know that when we have negatives, that we have to kick it downstairs. So this will actually become one over 25, but now with a positive three halves. So once you move its position, the exponent should become positive. And then I can write that in radical form. So that would be the square root of 25 to the third. Now I can do the same idea that I did here right? I can say 25 to the third power is the same as saying 25 to the second power times 25 to the first power, right? Having two of them times one more is going to give me three of them. But this one is going to come out. The square and the square are going to cancel, and I'm going to have a 25 down there. And then I'm still going to be left with the square root of 25. And if you were to type that in your calculator, you are gonna get five. 
Why? Because 25 is a pair of fives, right? So now you have this 25 that you already took out, and now you have a five that would come out from there. So your final answer should be one over 125. Now, again, it is possible to type that in your calculator and it will tell you the answer. But I promise you, when you're doing your test, you cannot go from this to this and tell me you did it in your calculator. I will want to see some of your steps. Now, your steps may look a little different from mine, and that's okay, as long as you're showing me your process, okay? There were some people doing some really interesting ways to factor on that first test. And as long as I could, as long as it wasn't just a bunch of scribble, like all these variables and expressions all over the paper, um, and as long as it was legible and I could tell what you were doing, it didn't matter whether you were doing the crisscross method, whether you were using a box method, or you use the AC method like I uh, showed you guys how to use, or if you were doing the trial and error. I just needed to see your process, okay? I needed to see where did you come up with these numbers? Why did you choose these numbers? Why did you put them in this order if you're doing trial and error, right? And some people did. They had a whole table of factors here, factors here, factors here. And I could tell where they got their numbers from when they guessed. That's perfect. It does not have to be done the way I do problems in order for you to get full credit. You just have to explain what you're doing thoroughly and then what you're doing needs to be correct. Okay. It can't be breaking any rules um, as far as mathematic rules, like all the properties, right? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I just don't want people to think they got doc points because they didn't do it my way because I'm not that kind of person. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do math and all of, as long as they're correct, there's a lot of ways that are completely okay. Okay, so we are done with this section now, P.2. So ideally what I want you guys to do over the weekend um, is, to get all of those, uh, all, it's just two, <laughs> but get those two homework assignments done over the weekend so that when we come back on Tuesday, that Tuesday day, and then that Tuesday night, all you have to do is work on the 1.5. Now, 1.5 is not super complicated. It's actually pretty simple. So it's not going to be like, oh my gosh, I need like gobs and gobs of time to do that assignment. It's not hard at all. And I anticipate that we will, even if we are face-to-face, -face, um, like uh, in person, um, I anticipate that we will finish the lecture early. So you guys will have some of that class time to actually sit there on the computer in the class and try to get as much of that 1.5 homework done before you leave the classroom, okay? Um, but you want to get that 1.5 done on Tuesday. So let me just go through the timeline. So we will do the lecture that Tuesday morning. You'll have all the rest of Tuesday to get the 1.5 homework assignment complete. And then I also want you to try to start looking at the unit review. So you might get through that 1.5 homework assignment in like 10 or 15 minutes. That's fantastic. Use the rest of your time to try to start the unit review. I want you guys to do the unit review before we meet for class, before I go over the lecture, so that I can address questions that you have over that review. And then also when you're done with that review, you have about four hours to, um, especially for the online class. For our face-to-face -face class, I may disable these discussions because we'll be having them in person, okay? But for the online class, that gives the online class about four hours to compile all of their questions, ask them, and then I can respond to them before they actually have to take the test. But that's the thought process behind all of those deadlines. So be very much aware that all the homework and the review are gonna be due that Wednesday morning. So on Tuesday, you wanna get the 1.5 homework done and you wanna get the unit review done, okay? Um, just make sure you get them done. If you have questions on any homework, regardless of which homework assignment it is, or if it's a review, 
you can text me questions. In the last lecture, I showed you guys how to do that, right? You take photos of the problem, take photos of your work. If you have a question, ask it. If your question is just, where did I go wrong? Then just say that. Um, and then I can respond to you and try to help figure out how to get to that, um, the correct answer, okay? But you guys are not on your own completely. I am here as a resource. Definitely take advantage of that. If you would like, you can always go to the tutoring. Um, let me go over that real quick because I had a few people that were still confused on how to go to tutoring. There's brain fuse tutoring over here on the left. Um, but again, you're only limited to a certain number of um, hours with that brain fuse tutoring. There's no limit to how many hours you can use of math world tutoring. And so that's the one I suggest. And then someone asked if they had a resource at another college, could they use that one? Yes, if you have a math lab or something like that at one of the other colleges, um, because you're a student at one of the other colleges, just happen to be taking a class at St. Phillips, you can use those resources as well. There's nothing that prevents you from using those. But if I scroll all the way down in my modules tab to the orientation module, you'll see this here that says virtual math world link. If you click on that, and it's always there, you just have to scroll all the way to the bottom. I like to keep the current stuff at the top and then push the old stuff to the bottom. So just scroll down and find that orientation, find the virtual math world link. And when you click on the actual link inside that page, you get to this and then here's where you see. Now our class is 1414, but right now the material we're doing is really, it's, it's in between this 410 class, which would be like the class before this class um, and between the 1414. So we're kind of doing stuff in the middle. So if someone has 1414 on their list of courses that they tutor, go with them they will be able to help you with what we're doing in this class, okay? So all these people that have 1414, even this one, this person here that has 1314, we haven't gotten to the actual college level math yet. So they should be able to help you as well, okay? So for now, anybody that has 1314 or 1414 under their list is gonna be who you go for. And I think it's pretty much everyone. I don't think anyone doesn't have yeah, everyone has 13, 14 on their list. So everyone should be able to help you. Um, and all you do, I'm just going to verify if I click on somebody's thing, it actually takes you straight into the Zoom meeting with them. Just, it doesn't make sense to go in there if they're not available, right? This person's only available Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at these times, nothing on Friday. And then on Saturday, they're available 8 to 2 p.m., okay? So, and it says that at the top, just in case you're wondering, how do I know that those are the days? It tells you the days of the week, okay? So just find somebody that's available when you're trying to jump on. And there's pretty much someone always, because look, you've got this person here from eight to 11.30. Then you've got someone there from one to six. And then you had that guy at the bottom that was there from 4.30 to, um, here's 9.30 to two. So there's always somebody there available. And if there happens to be more than one person available at a time, and you go jump into one person's Zoom, and they're helping someone, you may want to go jump into another person's Zoom just to see if they have no one, and maybe they can help you faster, right? Um, just to give you a little bit of advice in that regard. But that's it. That's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat right now. Okay, well, we finished, you know, a little bit, like maybe 19 minutes for me, which is not horrible. If we were in face-to-face, -face, that's the time you would use to do your homework before you leave. So that I kind of, you know, hope you get some of it done um, while you're with me. Okay, and then you can always ask questions. Um, okay, well, then if that's it, I'm going to stop the recording here. And